Hello. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, to all of our guests who are joining us online, um, good evening from where I'm speaking to you from. So we're going to get started shortly with today's event, and I just want to give um, some general housekeeping um, information for guests to pay attention to. So to um, all of our participants who are joining us um, virtually throughout the, um, at the over the course of today's event, we'll have some time to go through some questions and answers, so please make, fun make use of the Q&A function um, to share any questions that you might have with our discussant and our author, who are both here um, in person. And um, to get us started off officially for today's event, I would like to welcome Kirsten Eyes, who is the Director of Public Engagement and Resource Mobilization here at Aga Khan Foundation Canada. So please, let's welcome Kirsten. Uh, good evening, everyone. I suppose it might be good afternoon here in Ottawa, but this time of year makes it feel like good evening. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, perhaps, if you're joining us from elsewhere in the world. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are here today on the unceded ancestral lands of the Algonquin and Shnabek peoples. We're grateful for the stewardship and courage of elders and traditional knowledge keepers, past, present, and future. Joining us here at the DII, we sit quite closely to the place where the three rivers meet. This place is somewhere that the Algonquin peoples have been gathering since time immemorial, where there is a spirit of exchange, not only of goods and services, but of knowledge and tradition and ideas. And so we seek to continue this centuries-old tradition of sharing and exchanging ideas and building relationships here. It is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight both the author of the book we are here to discuss and the discussant who is excited to explore the depths of this work. Uh, Dan Bresnitz joins us this evening. Many of you would know that Dan is the Monk Chair of Innovation Studies, the co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab, and a professor of global affairs and political science at the Monk School and the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He's also a fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, where he co-directs a program on innovation, equity, and the future of prosperity. Before U of T, Bresnet spent eight years as a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He was the co-founder of a CEO software company in Israel and authored numerous papers, chapters, and edited volumes, as well as two award-winning books. We're here tonight to discuss, hopefully, the third award-winning book, Innovation in Real Places, Strategies for Prosperity in an Unforgiving World. And that book was chosen and will be probed through the depths of by none other than Nahed Nenshi, who served as Calgary's mayor for three terms between 2010 and 2021, during which Calgary was recognized as one of the best cities to live in the Western Hemisphere. I have been assured that Nahed does not want me to name all the awards that he won during that time, but please believe that they are numerous. Before his election, uh, Mr. Nenshi served as Canada's first tenured professor of nonprofit management at the Bissett School of Business at Mount Royal University. And before academia, he worked as a management consultant at the global consulting firm McKinsey & Company, ran his own firm, Ascend Group, where his client list included the United Nations. We don't know what happened in Nenshi's life prior to this, but I'm sure we might get to probe into some of the depths of that exciting history tonight as we explore a lot of fantastic issues. Uh, without further ado, uh, guests, please welcome to the stage Dan Bresnitz and Nahed Nenshi. It does, doesn't it? It's a little dangerous. But if we can make it through without knocking anything over, it'll be a good start. Thanks, Kirsten. Hi, Dan. Hello. How are you? I'm well. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in person and for joining us online uh, from all over the world to talk about innovation in real places, strategies for prosperity in an unforgiving world. There are a lot of interesting words here, Dan. <laughs> Um, we're talking about real places. I love your use of the word prosperity as opposed to wealth. And in my mind, I use the word prosperity a lot instead of wealth because to me it has a different meaning. 
and it has a meaning of prosperity for all, which I hope that we'll get to. Um, but that word unforgiving is probably the key theme that I picked up uh, from the book today. And we're thrilled to be joined here for those who are online by a very engaged looking audience. <laughs> Uh, who we're going to talk about a bunch of different things today around innovation, around a lot of what you've learned through a very interesting and deep career all over the world studying these issues. But at some point, I'd also like to take uh, a bit of a lens for what we're talking about, given the fact that we're here in the delegation of the Ismaili Imamath with the Aga Khan Foundation Canada to really talk about that word prosperity. You know, the goal of the organization that is kindly hosting us is really about eliminating global poverty. And we've heard so much around how innovation and economic growth is how to eliminate poverty in the world. And I suspect you're going to have some iconoclastic things to say uh, about that as we go forward. But Dan, let me just start with a simple question for you. You start in the very first line of this book, you say this book took you a long time to write. And as I read it, I feel like this book is the culmination of decades of your work, regardless of how long it took to write. Why'd you write this book? Who's it for? So those are two different questions, um, but that's okay. Uh, I will start with why I wrote it. I wrote it because I became very angry and very frustrated. So I've been uh, working on innovation and economic growth, uh, sadly to say for decades because I was hoping it's just five years ago that I started, but no. Um, and I got very, very angry with the debates we started to have around innovations and how that leads to economic growth. And especially this myth of what I called in the book techno-fetishism and our admiration of a very, very specific model of innovation-led economic growth in a very specific time, which is Silicon Valley of our days. Um, and I realized that the whole debate also lost its anchor. So we no, longer, we no longer even talk about why should we care about innovation. So this book, first of all, is to remind all of us why should we care about innovation and what innovation is. Um, and then there's the question of how we can, or can we, and how can we have innovation for local prosperity. And when I say local prosperity, and that's partly the reason why it took me so long to write, is, you know, as scientists, you're trying to uh, get like the ultimate ideal type, general, always working answer. Um, so you write, if you write a policy book, to a president of a world that doesn't exist and she can do whatever she wants and she'll have it. This book on purpose I wrote for what community leaders, mm -hmm. so what you used to be uh, only a few years ago, can do when he or she or they are actually, you know, the mayor of Calgary, not the president of a global world, with those limitations as well. Um, so the people who should, or I hoped, would read this book are not just, you know, our former students, but people who actually care about innovation and about equity, which is another word which I think we have lost the meaning of and we should regain, and prosperity. You know, uh, as a former community leader, uh, I read the book and I said, oh, geez, I think I've done everything he said not to do um, as we went through the book, hopefully with a little more success than some of the bad examples uh, in here. But can we just start with that word innovation? You know, what does that mean? And you talk a lot about innovation versus invention. Can you tell us a little bit about that distinction and what you think? how you define that word innovation. Sure, so let's start with what is innovation and, and why is it different from invention. So invention is the act of coming up with a new idea. Innovation is the act of taking ideas and putting them into a reality. So in the case of this book or when you talk about the econom economy, it's the act of taking ideas and using them to make new, better, or improved products and services, but it's not just new. It's not just the act of coming up 
with the latest of the latest new to the world. It's all through the way of how you produce goods and services. So coming up with a new product, uh, figuring out how to combine it with other things to have an improved product, uh, figure out ways of how to produce it better, how to sell it better, how to distribute it better, how to use it better. And as a matter of fact, when you realize that, you realize that the real impact of innovation is actually much more important in the later stages that mm -hmm. I just described. So since we have people here on Zoom or Teams or whatever, uh, let us remind all of us that if it was 10 or 15 years ago, so not that long ago, we would do everything in our power to prevent this from being teleconferences. Because right. You and I and all of us will have to go to specialized room, which will start at the cost, if I remember, I was working for Cisco at the time, about a million and a half of a cheap one. Uh, God only knows how much the data would cost. And the final product would be awful. And this would after 40 years of developing this technology. And yet, COVID appeared, and we just turned the bottom, and it worked and we could continue education, schools, and work, and even more importantly, we don't even think about the price anymore. So that's the moment when this very, very old technology actually changed the life of almost everyone on Earth who has mm -hmm. the possibility of doing it. Um, and that's after millions, if not hundreds of millions of engineering hours to improve slowly all those little technologies that we don't even think about until you and I can just click on the bottom, it works, and we don't care about the price. Um, and, and I think this is something that we should remember because it brings us back to why we care about innovation. So innovation is the only way to have a sustained growth and economic and, and health, wealth, being better for more people around the world. There is no other way. Um, it's not just a way to make billions. You know, the strangest thing happened earlier today, which is I met Dan for the first time at the airport. And we stopped uh, to have a chat and talk about tonight at the airport, and we grabbed a snack. And the people at the table next to us were eavesdropping on us. And then at some point, just jumped into the conversation. <laughs> And they were farmers from Manitoba, a farmer couple from Manitoba, and they had just been at the national meeting of the National Farmers Union. And we learned a lot about farming politics um, in those few minutes. But what struck me, because of the frame I was looking at things in, was the way they were talking about their own business and how they were talking about how all of these inventions over time that have led to massive increases in productivity in agriculture have also stripped the soil of its nutrients and of its value. And they were really struck by this question of what do we do now? And in the book you talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four innovation. And maybe I'm using your framework completely wrong, so tell me if I'm using it completely wrong. But it sounded to me like they were really focused on what you call stage three innovation which is the, exactly as you say, these small shifts that need to happen that can actually, in the end, make a big difference. You know, I often, when I'm talking about leadership, I say, look, if you're going this way and you make a one degree or a two degree shift, it may feel like you're moving in the same direction. But after a while, you end up going somewhere quite different. And so I'm just wondering, you know, especially because a lot of folks in this room will be concerned with agriculture and food production and hunger, Give me your, your, your reflections on that interesting conversation we had at the airport. So first of all, it was very interesting, and they were very passionate. Oh, great. And, and, and they kept giving us more and more books we had to read. It was yes. really something. Some of them from 1917. Yeah. I hope you have a list. I did. Uh, good. Uh, so please email that to me. But um, I'll do one step further because many of the people here were not with us at the airport. And let me for very briefly explain what Nahid is talking about as the four stages. So let's use an example like semiconductors because I did a lot of work on it and also because people now are aware that this industry 
exist because we have serious global production problem with it. So if you look at semiconductors and you look at places from Tel Aviv and Silicon Valley to Seoul, um, to Taipei in Taiwan, to Shenzhen and Dongguan in China, you'll find out that all of those places have really successful semiconductor industries you would look at the, same, at the name of a very big companies and you'll find that they're very, very similar. So you might think that it's the same industry. You actually look at what those industries do in those places and it is as different as can be. So in Silicon Valley in Tel Aviv, they came up with ideas to put on silicon. As the whole world now know, after COVID, there's only one place in the world and one and a half companies, Taiwan and TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, that actually know how to put those ideas into silicon. Uh, every smartphone, and I know that you have a collection of tablets and smartphone and smartwatches that you buy, no matter what the brand is, the second highest profits go to a Korean company because they control specific niches or LG, okay. um, and without the amazing amount of innovation of how you took tens of thousands of components and always changing materials and make that supercomputer when I was a child into a watch mm -hmm. and sell it in a price that we can afford and constantly change it that happens in China, um, we won't have any of it. So those are as different as can be, but what just happened by me explaining what happens in each place, I also told you who is working there. Mm -hmm. And also who is not working there. And also how they're being paid or reimbursed, who has a chance in life, and who is stuck in a treadmill to nowhere. Which I think is something that we have to recognize if we do care about prosperity. Let's go a little deep into that question because that was probably the most surprising part of the book to me was your real interest in this issue of equity. And I wrote this down. Uh, at the Canadian Institute uh, for Advanced Research, you run something called the Innovation, Equity, and the Future of Prosperity Initiative. Um, equity in the Future of Prosperity. I, I, I just kind of want to leave that hanging because I don't want to say too much about what you said, but... One of the real eye-openers for me in the early chapters of the book was around how places that have created extraordinary wealth, have created extraordinary economic development, such as Israel that you know intimately, maybe that's not the kind of economic growth and development that we want to look at. Well, I'll just leave it there and let you talk a little about that. So... Um... Usually I come into a room and after I tell those stories about Silicon Valley and Tel Aviv and a few other places, um, I'm giving the title as the most depressing speaker they had in like the last century. I can beat him. <laughs> we can have a competition. Uh, but let's be very clear. Um, this is what I call an average, the Silicon Valley model. It's also relatively new. Okay, because Silicon Valley was the engine of a widespread prosperity until the 90s. And then what we call globalization happened, what I call the fragmentation of production. So if you look at what happens now in Silicon Valley, and Tel Aviv is basically Silicon Valley on steroids, you have a system, but the real industry is not building big companies. The real industry, and I heard that you were a finance professor, very baby, baby finance yes. professor. Uh -huh. um, but the real industry is creating companies and selling them. Yep. Uh, either through IPOs, and then maybe you have a company, but really the reality is selling them to another multinational corporation for a lot of money. And you want to do it for as quickly as possible. And you don't really care, partly because your funder, the modern kind of venture capital, will not give you money to do any capital investment. So you will not create any production and any other jobs. So you now have a system in which you take the most gifted and lucky people in the world, those that have finished MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, University of Toronto, Waterloo, at STEM, so not the people I'm worried about. Um, you give them wages 
that are equivalent to the highest wages you can get in, in the US, so they will become millionaires. You give them lottery tickets, which is either stock or stock options, so they can become billionaires. And you now run the system for years, so they, their investors, a few celebrity chefs, I think we're in Ottawa, so Bekta and Shopify, but I never said anything bad about him, but still. But we're uh, going to talk about Shopify. Yeah. Um, are, I mean, they, they, they have paradise on earth, and it's wonderful. But then there's the other 85% of the population that are still stuck in the wages of the 70s and the productivity of the 70s. And I've been saying enough bad things about Israel. I also be serving as a Clifford Clark uh, economist of this country in the Department of Finance until a year ago. Our productivity is about zero. Made in wages in this country are flats in 76. Um, so it's not just Tel Aviv. Um, and this is a choice that we made when we decide on a specific model of economic development. Can I, can I, let's dig a little more deeply into that, because this is an area I do actually know a little bit about, despite not being a very good finance professor. You know, you said median wages, and, and I really am stuck on that, the, the, the fact that it's median wages, not mean wages, um, not the average, but the median. During the pandemic, uh, since the beginning of the ongoing pandemic, I always have to remind people it ain't over, it's nowhere near over, but we created in the world a new billionaire every single day. Billionaires used to be kind of rare. We created a new billionaire every single day. Yet for most people with inflation and the affordability crisis, they've seen their standard of living decline. I would further, I'd go even further than that, and suggest to you that your description, maybe this is your next book, your description of an economy that is built entirely on the early exit, not on building uh, sustainable, enduring businesses, is not just a description of the high tech industry, it's also a description of Calgary, Alberta. It's a description of the energy sector. And that has been one of my most biggest, one of my largest frustrations as an academic and as a policymaker, in that we built these tiny companies just big enough to sell. And as a result, we got some very, very wealthy people in Calgary. There are a lot of Maseratis and Bentleys. But for the average person, their quality of life and their standard of living has declined because rent has gotten more expensive. They have to shop in the same stores. They have to buy food in the same markets as the people at the Bentleys and the Maseratis. So I would argue, and I'm just looking for your reaction in your 18 months in Ottawa and the Department of Finance as the country's lead economist, we designed that economy. Mm -hmm. we desi it's not by accident. We designed an economy that only works if you have a huge number of people working for very low wages and a small number of people getting very, very, very wealthy. Do you agree with my, my provocative statement, first of all? You're welcome to disagree. But if you agree, in those 18 months in federal service, what are you going to do to fix it? So uh, let, let's start with a second, because that's a much easier answer. Uh, you get mostly frustrated if you work for federal government. But that's part of a game, right? It's on purpose a very slow system. You try to, what did you say first, one degree? Mm -hmm. So if you manage to one degree and it stays for 20 years after you left, you're the greatest revolutionary that Canada ever had. Okay? That's why I love municipal government. Uh -huh. Exactly. The second is I will slightly disagree with you. And where I will slightly disagree with you is, by the way, you might win. You might be the more depressing person than that. Um, if you look at Canada and a, and a system we actually aspire to look like, which is, by the way, Germany over Nordics, it's not the US, um, and you would see that both are very equal. Mm -hmm. Canada's before taxes, so the market outcomes in Canada are actually much more equal than Germany. By the way, it's a great thing, and here I'm more depressing than him, because our welfare states suck, unlike Germany. So if the market outcomes change in Canada, we're going to become exactly the society 
you just described, or the society they have south of the border in New York and San Francisco and Boston, extremely quickly because we actually don't know what to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where I think we failed, and that's how we are ending that way in Toronto, Calgary, and all the rest, is that we prefer to deny that the world has changed and we actually has a choice. And we love finance and we, for better or worse, uh, believed in free markets to a degree that my friends in the University of Chicago laughed on our expense for being so naive to actually believe what they wrote. Believe in what they were preaching. Yes. Um, and the result is starting to be what you're describing, but not everywhere in Canada, and we still have some time to change it. So... You know, I'm asking you to summarize not just the book, but the life's work. <laughs> what are those policy changes? What are the things we need to do to think about? Because, you know, I, I've seen some measures of inequality in Canada, and they've been growing alarmingly, uh, even in the last five years. You know, when I started talking about this uh, even two and a half years ago, I used to say that the levels of inequity, wealth inequity in Canada are as high as they've been since the Gilded Age, since the age of the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. They're now higher. They're numbers that we've never seen before, that Gini coefficient or whatever you call it, uh, is out of control. So what kinds of policy changes do you see that might help us reduce that burden of inequality? You mentioned one of them, which is the post-tax non-market um, shifts, um, which is, a, I think, a fancy way of saying progressive taxation and social programs to look after people at the bottom. But are there ways that the market could fix this? So the answer is yes. Um, so we're now let's just talk a little bit just about Canada, okay? So um, not only the maiden, let me first be depressing. Not only the maiden wages are flat, um, but the, because of that, the number of hours um, we spend with our kids, so we have our kids from 0 and 18, more or less, now because of a price, maybe until 45, but usually <laughs> 0 to 18 in our house. We spend eight months of real time, not sleeping, real time less with our children on average than the peers we want to be. Is that right? Yeah, oh. because we need to work so much more in order to have the same quality of life, okay? However, and where I see the change is actually people like you, meaning communities around Canada, figuring out, and that's most of this book, how they can specialize in different stages. Remember I told you the different stages have different distributional outcomes in innovation around specific industries um, so let's not talk about oil for a moment, mm -hmm. and let's not talk about Alberta. Let's say bad things about BC. Always. Okay? So BC's has the world's biggest um, pulp and, and, and wood industry, and yet the only thing BC does now is grow those trees and ship them as fast as they can uh, to China. Uh, they don't know how to process anything. So A, we missed all of the processing. But also, if you go to those BC forests, you will find out that everything that works there is not from a cheap country, but it's from a country called Finland, where they, with government policy, not only made their industry much more sophisticated, but also created an industry around it of how to manage those forests, and then sold this equipment to the world. So people talk about Industry 4.0. I've been to Finland in 2000, so it's a little few years before Industry 4.0. Everything was wireless, automated machine. Every tree was measured. Uh, cuts stayed on the side for another automated machine. All finished technology. Once they finish improving that, they sold it to us. You look at the biomass fuels for jets, because I heard that you like to fly a lot. The biggest company that now sells biojet fuels from those woods to the world is also finished. Why, why can't we do that in British Columbia? 
And that's, and, by, and, and that's where we should, we should be doing, and that's where we should be going, because Canada is a very big and diverse country, and because I don't think that the federal government, even if so wishes, can act fast enough. Oh, there's so much there. You know, I remember I didn't get to Finland in 2000, but that's back when I worked at McKinsey uh, with our friend Kalo here. And I remember doing a case study of one of those Finnish forestry companies that needed to get into the technology in order to figure out how to be better at forestry. And then they realized, oh, the technology is an interesting thing. And they ended up being the largest cell phone manufacturer in the world, Nokia. By the way, um, they also had the best toilet paper in the world. And the other option was to become specialized in, it was called silk toilet paper. So <laughs> who knew? I feel like a trip to Finland is, uh, is en route here. You know, meanwhile, when we think about coming back to Alberta, moving east a little bit, you know, we've developed the largest export industry in the country. Uh, a huge proportion of Canada's exports are in energy and oil and gas. We developed great techniques on how to better get at the oil and gas. We exported those techniques to our one customer, because we built the entire system with only one customer, to the point where five years ago, the United States became a net exporter of oil, and they were our only customer. To me, this is a really interesting example of, and I'd love your perspective on it, of how to do innovation wrong. <laughs> we did innovation really well, but one of the things we don't talk a lot about in this book is what about the customer, right? And we crafted a system where we only had the one customer, and that one customer was able to take the innovations that we developed and do a better job of them than we did, which I think you would, you would be a fan of. Uh, based on what you're saying in this book. But where did we go wrong in that industry? Um, where do you want me to start? Never mind all the Bentleys and Maseratis. Some people are very happy. Um, some, a lot of people. Um, many of them, your former voters. But um, A, uh, somebody should write the comparative history of Newfoundland versus Alberta, oil and the development of a province. So that's one where um, Alberta went wrong. The second is, I actually think that in the beginning we did very well. So as you know, but I don't know how many people know, um, we had a federal and provincial-led effort to develop those technologies, mm -hmm. which was very, very successful. And then the industry came. And then we did a thing which I'm sorry to say, People blame culture. I don't think it's culture, but it's very Canadian. We are right next to the US. So as soon as the US was willing to buy a lot from us, we forgot that there is the rest of the world. And we're doing it by way again today. Um, and that's in the book. You actually have, if you want to stay competitive, realize what you sell to the globe and I put it the globe, not the United States, you have to realize what you have to bring back from the globe so you will always be on a technological um, edge. And you never, ever, ever want to be the place where you just dig things from the ground and ship them. You want to develop the industries around them. The problem is that we made too much money. We created, and that's the federal system. You remember that thing called NAFTA? We created a system where uh, most, not just in oil, but most of our um, big corporation have some of the highest profits margin in the world and the lowest total factor productivity, which is a very fancy world for how you, utilize, you utilize human capital. We have the most highly educated workforce in the world and a total factor productivity of zero. Of zero. Yes, sometimes negative since 2008. So it's basically, um, I'm from Toronto, basically it's worse than the Toronto leaves. <laughs> That's not possible. You take the best players in the world, the best brains in the world, and you put them to work on the oldest technology possible, never utilizing their talent to the full, because you have a system in which you just can sell to the US and have enough profits. 
And that's not just the Canadian energy sector. That's the Canadian economy. That's a Canadian. You know, this issue of hewers of wood and drawers of water, where we have the resources, we send them to someone else who does something nice to them and then sells them back to us, is the historical story of Canada. And you see that still happening, eh? So uh, let's, let's, let's switch gears, but not switch gears a little okay. bit, because we're here in Ottawa. Yep. And you don't have very nice things to say about the venture capital mindset uh, in the book, but in particular, you give an example of, I think, exactly what we've just been talking about in Canada's most successful current tech company, Shopify. And you compare Shopify to Research in Motion, the makers of the BlackBerry. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and a little bit about how Shopify might be the modern version of exporting those resources and not getting the benefits here? Sure. So this is just this is an example of why I said that most places which are not Silicon Valley are Silicon Valley on steroids. And the reason is um, when most of your investors are not from your country, which is Canada and Israel, when you have a financial exit, what happens to all those profits? So not only you didn't employ a lot of people, but then all those profits go back, most of them, to the investors. If, and if the investors are not in your country, also the money doesn't stay in your country, does not get reinvested in your country, does not make people in your country rich or taxed. And that's basically the difference between, let's call, Black, let's call it BlackBerry for now, and Shopify. So BlackBerry, for multiple reasons, um, partly also the founders, was very careful ideologically to have most of the investors being Canadian. So when BlackBerry went public, most of those profits went back to the Canadian system. Shopify was mostly owned by Americans, venture capitals. So when they went public, most of that profit went back to the American venture capital, but then distributed that to their shareholders. And since both of you were in McKinsey, you know who are those shareholders, and none of them are Canadian. So basically, if you want to be cynical, and by the way, we should not be cynical about Shopify, what they did in Canada against all odds and against a system that does not want those companies to succeed is amazing. But if you look at the fact that you know, most of our investors are not Canadian, you can look at their IPO as a massive transfer of profits from Ottawa straight to New York. You know, I'm old enough to remember some of the previous uh, tech giants here in Ottawa, uh, Nortel, Corel. And it seems to me that back in those days, we had the BlackBerry uh, situation happen here in a really interesting emerging tech sector. And I, and I hadn't seen that with Shopify. So your explanation of it, I think, is, is very interesting. Uh, can you say a little more about it? In, you talked about the financial flows. What about talents? So... Um, I was in Kanata North. By the way, I'm not sure how many people even in, in Ottawa know that there's a very successful, let's call it science park or industrial parks in Kanata North. But if you look at the number of companies, the number of employees, the number of billions that go there is as good, probably better than the rest of Canada put together. Uh, but for whatever reason, nobody knows it even exists. Part of the reasons that is now multi, mostly multinational corporation. So if you want to think about what is missing, if a company like Norto or BlackBerry do the belly up, which we both did, in any other part of the world, but especially south of the border, we will now have four or five really big companies coming. Instead, what we have is a massive flow of those amazing talent um, to some of the most highly sophisticated R&D units, so they only employ the R&D engineers of the world foreign companies, from Huawei to Nokia. And the question is, why? And the answer is? <laughs> But we don't get our act together. We don't 
really think about how we can create those kinds of companies that also not just compete with you know the Silicon Valley startups, but you know a different way to think about it is can Canada and not just Canada, but especially countries that are even poorer than Canada, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do they really have to believe the Silicon Valley dream? Or a much better dream for them would be to be Finland, Taiwan, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden. By the way, check all those countries in the Innovation League, and I just named like the top four, five or six. Their equality and prosperity is unequal bar none for the good way, not the bad way that we talked about. Uh, and they are at the juggler so we will not have mRNA vaccines, we will not have medicine, we will not have, we will not have tailored or personalized medicine without Swiss companies basically doing all the work even if a name does not appear there. Um, we don't have semiconductors but also bikes without Taiwan. Uh, we already talked about Finland. Why does Canada have to dream only American dreams instead of Canadian dreams? Folks, we're going to finish up this conversation with another question or so up here. Uh, but we do have a lot of time for dialogue. So think about your questions now. If you're watching online, submit them through the Q&A uh, feature. And we're going to open up the conversation in just a minute. But there's two places that that last, that last answer really wanted me to... Is taking me uh, with you here. The first is... When you mention those places, Taiwan, um, you talk a lot about Taiwan in the, in the book, uh, Switzerland and so on, I believe one of the things you're saying in the book is they, rather than saying we want the venture capital driven invention philosophy, find the next big thing, develop the unicorn, they found the places where they could really specialize. So Taiwan semiconductors, for example, and then contract manufacturing, um, which, uh, you know, spun off a lot of different things. So is that the secret sauce here for Canada to think about where can we specialize rather than try to follow the exact same venture capital driven model? That's one. Um, by the way, in the book, I am, and I think this is really important because I think we again fell into the trap of Silicon Valley and we talked only about high tech. In the book, there's example of shoe manufacturing. Yes. In the book, there is an example of bicycle manufacturing because innovation happens in all industries, from forestry to minerals and extractive industries like mining and oil to supposedly the industries of the future. So first, the first trick in that secret sauce is to realize that and not get obsessed about only two sectors. The second is to... Biotech and ICT. Yes, mm -hmm. in different names. So now we call it artificial intelligence instead of ICT. Right. Um, the second is to realize that there are multiple ways in which to innovate. Each one of them necessitate, because you talk about finance, um, different financial system. So if you want to create a TSMC, the last thing you want is venture capital because you are going and and that's New York Taiwan Stock Semiconductor Market. Manufacturing Corporation. Yes, yeah, correct. Because you need a system in which you can put down forty billions in capital equipment every two or three years. Venture capitals will never do that. Will never develop this business model because they want to exit. They want exit, but also the New York Stock Exchange will not let you have it. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out difference. The same if you're in bicycle and shoe manufacturing. The second is you need to think about what your education institution do. It's very different if your aim is to become Taiwan or your aim is to become Stanford. Um, the same uh, needs to go to what kind of shared asset and public spaces your policymakers need to do. And also, how do you relate to the, the, the other part of the world? 
which part of those supposedly free trade agreement, which are now six million words, each one of them, so they're not free, uh, you actually need to pay attention to. Should you need to pay attention to the fact that you can control your diary farmers, which we talked about, or should you actually read chapter six about IP and who actually is going to gain most of the royalties? Those are things that we didn't do, but even more importantly, um, we, we meaning the West and the rich, now tell the rest of the world, I'm just looking at those pictures, that their dream should be a venture capital and a science park. And you know, that's really where, um, by the way, I will just say one quick thing, which is one of the little things that just screamed out at me in the book is something you just said, which is China was very good about sending its companies to the international standards organizations meetings to develop standards that actually matched their needs uh, based on all of that. And that's where Huawei came from, basically. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, so but the, the place I want to end with you is exactly what you just said, which is what are the lessons here for the global south? When we think about, you know, we're talking about Canada and what we can do, but, you know, when you think of where Taiwan started, for even where Israel started, 100,000% um, inflation at some point in there, there may be well be lessons here for helping craft the economy in really the least developed countries. Have you thought about that and what might be in there? So, um, A, yes, indeed, my very first book, um, looked at um, free economies that now we can't believe it, but they were really, really poor. And we're also told that they will stay poor forever, Israel, Ireland, and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, and how public policy led them to prosperity. Um, and I think the real lesson is that each and every one of them figured out um, how can then they be prosperous? And each one of them develop a very different set of policies. By the way, I looked at the same industries, so hardware and software. It's an old book from like 2007. We used to call them hardware and software back then. Um, and how they did it, and how they curved a very specific part of a global industry and claim it as theirs. Of course, each one, and that's what led me in between a book about China to this book, with very different outcomes in terms of prosperity or wide shared prosperity. But each and every one of them did not go and get, sorry, but I'm going to do it, McKenzie consultant from the United States to tell them how to do Silicon Valley. But instead, even if they got McKenzie consultant, they said, okay, those are the lessons, but how can we tailor them? Right. Super. Let's open it up. Uh, I have so many more questions, but let's open it up. Uh, we'll start in the room. Uh, there, I would ask you please to use the microphones on either side so that the people on the stream can hear you. Uh, so just come up to the microphones, and we will take the first questions. Please go ahead, uh, sir. So. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I have a question. So uh, I'm working in the computer industry, computer science. So uh, I have followed some of these companies that they kind of uh, startups. And you work even in a startup that uh, they kind of uh, they build a startup and then they have an exit plan and they can sell it. But I see that plan is not working that much anymore. I see big companies like Amazon, Microsoft. So, if they see a startup is successful, they build the same thing. So, um, so don't you think? Uh, so um, it makes me think like the Israel that is still very successful in selling those. I mean, some of the companies, if they start up, is so complicated. Like I don't know, like ChatGPT, the startup. Those maybe the big companies cannot replicate them, but many other companies they they can replicate them easily. So. Uh, so I was wondering, like, is maybe it's more than just uh, maybe because the Israel government maybe has more influence globally, they are able to kind of succeed in this kind of selling these businesses rather than Canada or something. So 
about that? Um, not necessarily. So, and I'll tell you why. I remember doing presentation about those industries, and it used to be when I presented Israel, which had nothing, by the way. Just to put in perspective, 68, and the reason I'm saying 68, because it was the first time that Israel even bothered to do any study about what it has. Nobody used the word innovation or high tech. They used to call it science-based industries. They found that there's 867 or 76 people with any kind of academic education work in R&D throughout the whole civilian sector. Uh, 100 for a thousand percent more in one decade, okay? And I remember giving the presentation for the first 10 years and said, Israel, a country of six, seven million people, the highest number of IPOs after the US in Canada on NASDAQ. Canada is gone. So, um, it's our failure. In terms of Israel, we just become, it's basically an outpost of Silicon Valley. And you see also that problem. So I agree with you. It's much harder, especially if you're no longer allowed to really think long term, but you have VCs and they want the money now. So what you see a lot of those companies as basically a knee. They go up, they go create, they get sold, somebody else control them. And either they become part of, you know, alphabet, or they need to move to a different business sector because alphabet moved in. So I agree with that. I just think that Israel became much, much, much better in hooking up to the world financial markets and understanding that this is a game. Um, and Canada didn't, partly because Israel didn't have any other game. But the effect for about 85% of the population of Israel are not positive. And that's the negative side we almost never hear about. Well, we hear about it in Silicon Valley now, but before reading your book, I hadn't heard about it in Israel at all. Yes, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thanks very much for the presentation. My name is Rez. I work next door at, uh, at Global Affairs. I know uh, Professor Bresnitz, he, he, I tried to help connect him when I used to work at the ISET Innovation Lab. Um, so thank you very much for both being here. I wanted to say a few things. One is uh, there are a number of government innovation labs out there. I'm a big proponent of public sector innovation. Some have folded. We had a really nice collaborative space, but because of COVID, it's being converted into a virtual summit studio. Summit diplomacy is important, but collaborative spaces are also good because space matters and the way people interact and, and come up with ideas. So I wanted to talk to uh, for Mayor Nenshi for a moment as well about um, public sector innovation. I liked your three ideas for three ideas for Calgary model. Um, I met former Mayor Watson at the Harveys here on Elgin. And he's like, you can run it, Reza. So I was like, thanks. Why don't we have that? Bring it here. And I've also been trying to get public sector innovation started in Ottawa. I've talked to two city councilors. I get pushed through the bureaucracy and then I die. And calling them is very difficult. I'd love to see a public sector innovation lab in our city. It helps for co-creation, citizens, and come up with solutions. Um, if you have any ideas on that, please let me know. And also, take, I like to take co-workers out for cultural events. I'm a big proponent in, well, we believe in cultural diplomacy and culinary diplomacy with other nations, but I believe it should be done to drive employee engagement. So I take employees out to the gallery, did two trips already. I've noticed some of our cultural institutions are not very, I'm losing the mic, uh, are not very participatory. They're not very interested in dialogue. And I understand they have their mandates, but there's a movement called the Participatory Museum to make these institutions more a space, a co-creative space. So I just want to know if we can get a public sector, public sector innovation lab happening in Ottawa, and how do we make our cultural institutions a little bit more participatory? Thank, Thank you. you. You know, we were just talking about innovation in the public sector, um, and I was saying that I am perhaps more optimistic than you are about the ability uh, for the public sector to be more innovative. That's because I come from municipal government, which I think is easier than federal and provincial government in doing that. Um, I'm much more skeptical about labs than you are, Reza. Um, I used to walk by the public sector innovation lab in City Hall at the City of Calgary every day and watch the people with their big white uh, whiteboards and colored markers and they wore lab coats and it just all gave me a headache, really. Um, but for me, the innovation that we ran through um, in municipal government was actually very, very simple. So over the time that I was mayor, we grew um, the population of Calgary by over 40%. 
but we had fewer civil servants at the end than we had at the beginning. And every time I say that in Ottawa, people clutch their pearls and grab their hearts. But here's the other thing, especially given the growth in the federal public sector over the last little while. Only 40%. Only 40%. Our citizen satisfaction numbers were higher at the end than they were at the beginning. And we didn't lay people off, but well, we laid a few people off. But by and large, we accomplished what we did with a very, very simple model. If you go to Calgary City Hall, even today, my successor has not torn down the posters yet. There are posters everywhere that have the mantra of the city. And the mantra of the city is simply making life better every day. And so for the 11 years that I was mayor, we went through a process that I called transforming government. And it was based on, well, I always say I'm not very bright. I only have two answers to every question. And it's the same two answers to every question. And the two answers are take a systems-wide view and put the person you're trying to serve at the center of the web. And too often in public services and public sector, we don't serve the citizen. We serve the bureaucracy. We serve the history. We serve the forms. We serve the we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work. And flipping that around to serve the citizen means something very simple. So I encouraged all of my 23,000 colleagues to ask themselves the same question multiple times every day. How is what I am doing right now making it better? How is what I am doing right now making it better for a citizen to live here? And the trick here was that if it's not making it better, we empowered people to stop doing it. I sometimes I called it the stop doing dumb stuff. And in fact, civil servants know better than anybody what the dumb stuff is. And so doing that empowerment really led to a shift in thinking. So I'll give you one quick example and then I'll shut up because we're here to listen to the smart person on the stage, not me, but there was one little thing. You know, we, we had a program that I ran out of the mayor's office with a very inventive name. It was called Cut Red Tape. And we went out to all our, all our colleagues at the city and said, what irritates you about your job? You know, what would you change? And one of the things we heard from the people who worked in the cashier's office on the third floor of City Hall, where there's huge lineups, where people are coming to submit their building permits and whatever else, they said the thing that really makes people mad is they get there and they have no idea how long they're going to be in line and their parking runs out. So they're mad because they're worried they're going to get a parking ticket, but if they leave to go pay their parking, they're going to lose their spot in line. Very simple thing, right? So we made changes at several levels. Level one, we put a parking machine in the lineup so that if you were worried that you were going to lose your time, you could just go to the machine and add time. That was step one. Step two, we digitized the process of buying parking so that you had your phone and the app would just allow you to add time on the parking. Step three, we digitized the whole process so that you could submit your building permits online and not have to go to City Hall and park your truck in the first place. So you see how that is all about putting the citizens' concern at the center, but then understanding their deeper concerns and fixing the problem. The challenge we have in the federal civil service, if I may, is that we are so remote from actual real people and their actual real needs in life that asking that question, how, do, how is what I'm doing right now making life better, is actually a very hard question. But it's still true. And so that, to me, is, is a very naive and simple answer, but a very powerful one. Sorry. Comments, thoughts? So I'll just add... And I'll skip the cultural question. We can chat about that later, cultural I'll, institutions. I will, I will just add two things. A, in Calgary, I just heard there was a political leader that empowered the public servants to change. I will leave it at that in the air in Ottawa. <laughs> Uh, and the second is that leader actually ask them for what they think needs to be done instead of uh, training them that the only role is a political leader will come, she will tell you what they were elected to do, and then you just operationalize that. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll just stop it there. Uh, oh my gosh, so many more. Do we have any online questions that we want to go to? Do you want to do that now? Why don't we grab an online one? 
Um, so I'll just read the two questions that came in online so far. So the first question asks, with the emergence of AI in the past few months, where do you see the business world in the next decade? And then Easy the, one. <laughs> and then the next question asked here is, the person states that um, you are crystal clear about Canada's anemic innovation performance, which is hard to disagree. So if you had a magic wand, what three to five measures um, should the federal government introduce to improve inclusive and sustainable growth? Now, this is giving our federal structure and our economic makeup. So AI question first. I'll remember the second question. So you, you, you say you had a line in the book that said something like, it is a joke to call the machine learning we have right now artificial intelligence. But I think things have changed even since the ink dried in this book. So what do you think? Uh, where are we on artificial intelligence and how big a deal is it? So it's a it's, it's different thing than, you know, two different questions. Whether this is actually intelligent and whether it's a big deal. So in the end of the day, unless you're very cynical about we, what we are, uh, even the best artificial intelligent models that we have now is a massive probability machine. Mm -hmm. Okay? Full stop. Uh, also, by the way, just so you'll know, those of you who care about green, every time you ask chat GPT a question, you burn a whole forest. Just so you'll know that. Okay? In terms of energy. Just check how much energy we are using in order for people to have a conversation with chat GPT one evening. Now, other than that, it is going to change business, especially if the cost of energy is not included. Uh, and it's going to change business in very, very, um, how would you say, um, profound ways. The real question is which society it will change business so it will empower human beings to think more and have better jobs and more jobs, and which society will have policies or incentives to make sure that businesses are focusing on replacing humans with machines. And then the last question for Canada is which one we are choosing, or by not choosing, we know exactly where we'll end up which is the second unhappy uh, choice. Which kind of takes us to the second question, right? One of the themes that we've had when we talk about Canada is how our lack of ability to choose has led us to certain places, our lack of ability to just stand firm on uh, picking a direction. So the second question is like the biggest question of all, but I'm gonna put it to you anyway, which is given our terrible productivity numbers, and the question actually asked, what can the federal government do? I don't like that framing because I'm not sure they're the answer. If they're the answer, I want to know what the question is. But um, what can Canada do to start fixing that problem? It sounds so amorphous. Our productivity no, is low. No, no, no. can get their head around that. But what can we do? Okay. So first of all, you know, um, when you um, have an addiction problem or an illness, the first step is admitting you have a problem. It is beyond the pale that until about two years ago, our ministers of finance were told not to use the word productivity in their budget and, and even admit we have a problem and that problem of innovation is in the private business sector. So folks and, and everyone else, the people who fail Canada are in the private sector. Apart from the startup sector and exporters and a few bright spots, it's our corporation. It's not just that they don't do R&D and we are the only G7 and OECD country that the business investment on in R&D is going down year after year. By the way, congratulations, we are now below Poland, are just so you'll know. Um, but it's every proxy of measuring how business engage with knowledge. So the UN Development Index, we were number one. Yes. All the other 
that were in the top five are still in the top five. Uh, there is the uh, measure of complexity, how sophisticated our industries are. Um, we are a resource-based economy and we should use it. So we should never expect to be top 10. But we are now at the level of Kyrgyzstan. Mm. Now, the business people are not stupid. This is a choice we made as Canadian to put the incentives in place for those business models to be very profitable. So what the federal uh, um, can do, there's two ways you can change business behavior, okay? And the by way, the only people who innovate in an economy are individuals, we call them entrepreneurs and businesses. It's not universities, it's not the, the federal government. Um, we want to change their behavior. We can give them bribes. We Are will you give talking you about battery plants? Uh, by for means? example, but that's actually zero innovation, so let's not move there. But shred or grants to do more R&D, right? Lower the risk, hey, if there's a little bit of money, try up. We can also give them sticks. And the sticks is... When was the last time you heard the federal government talk about the competition framework? Where was the last time you heard the federal government or any government in Canada talk on the fact that you said you had only one customer? Yeah. Why did Alberta chose only one customer? It was Canada that did that, but yes. Finally, they bought us a pipeline, but uh-huh. So here is one thing that you, we need to do as in a country and that is starting talking about the other side of equation. I don't blame each and every CEO, because when you're a CEO, you have one job, and the job is to bring the highest profit margins at the lowest risk and uncertainty for your shareholders, if you want, but also for your stakeholders. We created a system where you can create as profit as high as the best American companies without engaging with new knowledge. We, as Canadians, need to change the system. Carrots and sticks. Okay. Let's go. I, I see lots of hands, so let's do a little lightning round here and see um, how quickly we can get through some of these questions. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Marjan Montazemi, and I was working formerly with the UN. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading your books, not just the last one, but others as well. Um, the topic is really fascinating. Um, I'm happy that you talked about education and Finland, because Finland is also an example of innovative education as well for, for many of us interested in this topic. So um, my question is about uh, the Global South, um, and um, I'm, you know, specifically uh, talking about uh, least developed countries in Africa, um, where a few, about five years ago I was working in one of, the, uh, one of those countries, and I was talking about introducing innovation uh, in terms of educating young people. Um, and the response I got from inside and outside was, we are dealing with survival issues and you're talking about innovation. Um, for me, the survival is that you cannot not talk about innovation anywhere in the world right now just because we cannot leave anyone behind. The, the, the train has left the station. And education is one of those ways, you know, in the entrepreneurial mindset that you were mentioning, you know, that's where you start, you know, educating the young people. So my question to you is, what is your um, um, take on the fact that innovation is a spectrum? Um, that when we talk about innovation, yes, there is the, the high-tech companies that you were referring to, but uh, you know, the entry point for innovation is different. Um, and how do we try to level the playing field uh, in terms of bringing on board uh, the countries that are least developed? You said lightning round of I did, questions. That's such a big question. Why don't you take that one and then we'll take these next two questions? Sure. So I'll be very, very uh, short. A, that's why I wrote this book with innovation, it's not just high tech. So obviously, you know my answer there. Um, once you do that, then you can start thinking about niches and curves and where, oh, I wouldn't say every place, but where a lot of places can play. Um, by the way, not each and every one of them will succeed, but at least now you can speak about options and choices. 
Um, you can also speak about education and what kind of education actually fit that model of development instead of you know creating. I, I said Stanford too many times, so let's me be bad on my own university. MIT in the desert, okay? Maybe you want actually the University of Waterloo might be a much better fit. Um, but I don't think we do that. I think that we are still obsessed about finding one answer. And by the way, the UN is partly to blame because then you have one answer that you just go, oh, uh, you're on the map here. OK, that's the one. You're on the map here. Let's just do exactly the same. Instead of trying to figure out what works where and maybe create this network where those places actually learn from each other instead of from us because we are supposedly so, so much more smarter. Great. Uh, we're going to go there, there, and there, and we're going to take all three questions. Go ahead, Shaliza. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Shaliza Sajwani. Um, to provide a tiny bit of context, I'm the uh, co-chair of the Canadian Association of Pharmacy for the Environment, and I also provide, um, I'm an adjunct professor who provides um, advice with regards to planetary health uh, indicators within the pharmacy curriculum. Um, my question to you is about uh, social entrepreneurship. So what do you think about the idea of the implementation of services from a startup perspective that can um, you know, both advance patient care, reduce um, emissions, and do this in a in a cost neutral or cost or a pro profitable manner. Is that is that really kind of a sustainable model that we can think of? And what have you seen with regards to social entrepreneurship nationally? Okay, so that's the first question around social entrepreneurship, whether we can have innovation through business uh, mechanisms in the social sector. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm Linda O'Neill, uh, an interested community member. Uh, when I think about, when I compare Canada, say, to uh, Scandinavia, one obvious question is, does the fact that we have such a vast country and such a small population create challenges? Great. And? I'm Ingrid Hauk, a former executive in the federal government a few decades ago. In the opening remarks, I thought Nahid talked about equity. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just wanting to get your views on equity as you presented in the book. I mean, you've talked a lot here about financial and economic equity, but, but are you looking at equity in a, in a broader way, social equity, you know? well-being, those kinds of things. Okay, three really interesting and quite different questions. So, can social innovation and social entrepreneurship be part of the world we're looking at? Are we hampered by the fact that we've got so darn much land? And does equity go beyond financial equity? I'm gonna let you deal with all three of them. Okay, uh, is this is the end? I just oh, need I to know. know. I okay. know. How are we doing? So I will, yeah, I will assume this is the end, and I will try to to, to, to go on a high note. Here's a real deal. Uh, and I'm looking at both of us and some of the crowd. If you're a baby going to be born and you don't know how you look like, unless you know you're going to be tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and Nordic, the best country to be born at is Canada. Okay, let's not forget that. So with all the things that I said bad about Canada, I also volunteer to be a year and a half as a Clifford Clark economist. We are still the most tolerant society. Uh, the American dream, as my American friend says, uh, still is alive and well in Canada. My worry is that we have become complacent. And all those things that I told you are very, very slow, but by now very, very long term. And as you know, once you are in the decline for a long period of time, you have two problems. A, you're stuck, and you don't know what to do, and B, at some point, it starts to go sharp. I don't want us to change after we go sharp, okay? So that's why I'm really harsh on us, because I think too many people are just happy enough to cry when they have a sip of wine or coffee, but not actually fight to change the system. And it's horrible because our prime minister misused it too many times, but the world does need Canada because 
it's the best model that we as humanity has done up until now. So let's keep it that way, okay? Let's just put it there on the table. Now let's talk about other issues. Social entrepreneurship. So uh, I actually was very keen on the model. Um, not only that, but I worked and created a graduate seminar with real project with Social Entrepreneurs Ireland, which was then the group that tried to bring social entrepreneurship to Ireland after the 2008 crisis. So Ireland was in a dire strait. It can do a lot of good. It is A, not the only answer. And for it to actually succeed, you need a public service that then said, yes, what you did is amazing. Now we're going to do it on a federal or municipal level. If your public service says, yes, it's great that you have a service which is so much more efficient, but we have been doing it for 30 years and I'm not going to change, it's not going to happen. So how do we tie social entrepreneurship with policy? is at least as important as just having social entrepreneurship. On the size, yes, not only we're bigger, but we are an immigration-based society, and we actually let our immigrants succeed. I don't know if you visit Malmo, Sweden, but if you want to be very depressed about Sweden, visit Malmo, Sweden. Something very bad is about to happen in Sweden. Yes. But I will say, the one example that I used on purpose is Finland. It's a huge country with very, very few people, very cold, and yet they managed to do it. Um, the last question. Equity. Equity. Is oh. equity beyond income inequity, so, social equity. So I think the most important thing, and remember what I said about the American dream, equity is not just after the fact. So what I don't like about Germany is yes, they're very equal, but after the fact. Um, so you will never be poor or completely uncared for, but only very, very few people have a chance to become really successful and have fulfilling ah. life. And that's why I don't say equality, I say equity. We are in Canada, still have that. We also still have one of the world's best education system, K to 12. By the way, the Edmonton should teach, all the Edmonton should teach Canada, especially Toronto, a lot about how you can do that in the private sector. But again, I'm, I'm in Toronto, we're in Ontario, we have Doug Ford, but especially in Toronto, um, where the progressive are actually doing it. We are destroying choice in our public system, um, which, in the name of fairness, in a way that actually creates less equity and less chances for real fulfilling life for the people that have to use the system. So I'm not worried about you know, people with 250 to 500 or more thousand years. We'll go to the private sector. But if we don't figure out our K to 12 again, and also tied to the right labor market, we are going to significantly decrease equity in Toronto and Ontario. Well, folks, one of the good things that Canada did to become more innovative is to import Professor Dan Bresnitz. <laughs> so this is Professor Dan Bresnitz. The book is Innovation in Real Places, Strategy for Prosperity in an Unforgiving World. And thank you so much for being part of the conversation. And let's just keep innovating. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Khalil Sharif. I'm the CEO of Aga Khan Foundation Canada. And uh, as we conclude this evening, it's left to me to um, thank uh, both Nahid and Dan for uh, joining us. Uh, Global Reads is our uh, little experiment to find people of uh, consequence in Canada, um, uh, political and public policy environment, uh, have them identify um, uh, 
uh, interesting books that might change us and inspire us and provoke us, and then we put them on stage together and we see what happens. And we've had an extraordinary set of experiences, and I'm really delighted that Nahid and uh, Dan tonight have uh, extended our streak on, uh, on, that, uh, on that record. Um, there are um, many issues that the Aga Khan Development Network uh, is concerned about uh, today around the world. Uh, we are obviously going through a period of particularly acute uh, um, uh, conflict uh, fragility. And um, it has long been our concern that one of the great issues that humanity confronts is the question of pluralism, which is how is it that we live together uh, in light of our differences. Uh, but it is also the case, uh, increasingly, uh, that we are concerned about uh, the future of economic development in all parts of the world, especially in the parts of Africa and Asia where we are present. We are in danger of being living under the tyranny of nostalgia, because the last time we saw an extraordinary economic advance in the developing world was the experience of the East Asian tigers in the last century where we saw this extraordinary uh, advance of um, rapid industrialization through export-led manufacturing. Uh, it is now clear from Dan's book, but from also uh, much other analysis, that it's not clear that that result was, in fact, what we wanted if we were really cared about shared prosperity. But even if it was, whether it's even available to us anymore, given the very um, radical changes in the makeup of the global economy and global supply chains. And therefore, we look out to the world with a sense of bewilderment and confusion. We do not know now what it looks like to pursue an economic development path that responds to both our concerns around sustainability and equity. So what we need is ideas. We need directions. We need provocations. And we invited Nahid and Dan here tonight because Dan's book, Innovation in Real Places, is exactly the kinds of ideas and directions that this moment calls for. That we do not need to be living under the tyranny of models which are inappropriate or glorify inequitable methods of um, economic development because they're the only ones available. We're being told here that, in fact, the repertoire of possibilities in front of us today is effectively infinite, that it's in our hands now to shape those policies and those directions in line with both our ideas and our ideals. Those are available to us today. But we do need now, it seems to me, to unleash a repertoire, a very large set of experiments around the world that take the changes in the global economy seriously, most importantly, as Dan tells us in the book, this unbundling of global supply chains, so that even in the most remote part of the world, you might be able to find a place in global supply chain where you, your community, can make a contribution, that you can be at home and be part of the world, that you can take all the human capital um, and social capital of your community and make it economically active in a way that shares the prosperity for, uh, to you and your communities. That's available to us today. There are no recipes in this book, but there are ingredients. And that, I think, is a great service to us. So Dan, I wanna, on behalf of all of us in this room and who are joining us online, but all of us uh, who are dedicated to the possibility that the current economic advances in technology, in communications, in globalization might be also opportunities for the world's poor, for all of us who are committed to that idea, I want to thank you for bringing us this book, for laying it out with such clarity, and for resisting, actually, the idea of blueprints and recipes, but reminding us and cataloging all the assets that we have at our disposal to be combined by communities themselves, but giving them a sense of hope and direction and rigor. So that's what this book represents for me personally, and I think for our efforts in trying to underwrite a, a future of pluralism and prosperity for the world at this difficult time. Um, so Danny, thank you very much for uh, bringing us this book. Uh, I commend it to you. Uh, it sounds like there's a whole um, library of other books that Dan has written as well that I ought to be commending you uh, as well. Um, and Nahid, 
of course, who uh, is that rare uh, leader in our midst who brings uh, a combination, that very unusual combination of extraordinary intellectual rigor, the personal attributes of um, accessibility and communication savvy, and an ethic of service to advance a common good. That those three things have come together in Nahid and has come together on this stage tonight. Nahid, we're very, very grateful. Thank you for being part of this. And I thank all of you for being part of this community of conversation and exchange that we hope will lift our collective horizons for what a more peaceful and prosperous and post world we might, uh, we might be able to introduce at these difficult times. So thank you. Good night. Thank you.